Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Step Central webinar, the SUNY Oswego NSF STEM Step Bridge Camp and Assessment Strategy, presented by Dr. Shashi Kember at SUNY Oswego. Hello. Um, my name is Tanya Siemens, and I am the manager of the Step Central Project, which works to cultivate a community of practice for STEP grantees and anyone um, working to improve undergraduate STEM education. We offer online resources, webinars, blogs, and discussion groups to encourage co-learning and um, collaboration on, on undergraduate STEM education nationwide. And I hope all of you will um, take an opportunity to join the community of practice, improve your own practice, and connect <clears throat> network with others. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Shashi Kanber. He's a professor of physics at SUNY Oswego with research interests in astrophysics, and STEM education. He is a PI and co-PI on SUNY Oswego's STEM and STEP grants and was actively involved in a number of STEP, STEM initiatives SUNY-wide, such as the STEP Replication Project. I'll pass the mic to you now, um, Dr. Kenber. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Can you hear me? Yep, okay. So thank you very much, Tanya and STEP Central for inviting me to take part in this uh, webinar, the, the Sunny Oswego NSF STEM Bridge Camp and Assessment Strategy. Um, the work was largely done by myself, but Eric Olson and Karen Valentino also contributed significantly to what I'm going to present today. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and have the first sort of interactive poll, I believe. Next mm -hmm. slide. Yep, yeah. yeah, I'm advancing it, I think. <laughs> okay. Hmm. There it goes. Okay. I'll open okay. the poll. Okay, everybody can select your answers here. Okay, I think uh, most people have replied, Tanya. Okay. But I, I seem to have, okay, I seem to have lost the screen, but let's uh -oh. see what happens when you close the poll. Will it come yeah, back? Yeah. yeah, okay, it's back. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can see the poll results now, hopefully. Okay, so uh, I, at least at SUNY Oswego, I mean, I, I wouldn't claim to know this for everybody, for all colleges, but at least at SUNY Oswego, we find that students fare poorly in their first university math course is the biggest impediment to STEM retention. Um, it's sort of related to inadequate preparation, but the next slide that I will show you and the subsequent slides will show you that, in fact, a lot of students do have adequate preparation in math, but various other factors conspire to, for them to fare poorly in their first university math course. That first university math course could be anything from calc, pre-calc, algebra, any one of those courses. So could we go to the next slide? Okay, so just a, a quick slide, slide showing to you as we go. It's a very beautiful campus on Lake Ontario in the upstate New York, just about 45 minutes north of Syracuse. We recently got a new science building. Uh, it's a really nice uh, environment to work in. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so everybody, I guess, is aware that there's a need to increase STEM graduates. And we find, again, that at Tony Oswego, many students leave their STEM major at the end of the first year because they fare poorly in their first math course, whether it's pre-calc, algebra, or calc. Uh, it usually happens in their first semester, and they get a D or an E, and they're already behind, behind the curve going into their spring semester, and, and you know, things snowball from there. But the interesting thing we find, at least at SUNY Oswego, it, is that there's no statistical difference between incoming SAT or the incoming math SAT 
between students who do well, and I'll define students who do well in their first semester math course as getting an A, B, or C, or students who do not do well in their first semester math course, that's getting a D and an E. So those two groups of students, that is those who get an A, B, or C, or those who get a D and E, there's no real difference in their math preparation as they come in into Atsum Yasvigo. And so that really relates back to my to the poll question about inadequate preparation. Uh, so can we have the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So the idea of the bridge camp, of course, is not new to San Luis Rigo, but we started doing it here with an NSF STEM, which started in 2011, and that had funds for uh, specifically a math camp. It was a three-week residential camp, which uh, started just before the fall semester. Uh, there were lectures in the morning and STEM talks by the faculty uh, in the afternoon. We had senior undergraduates as chaperones, <laughs> for want of a better word. They were mainly there to make sure the students got up and came to the lectures in the morning and try, did homework and made, just to hang around with the, with the students in the afternoon. This was very much a you know, preliminary thing. We were learning a lot of things in the first year that we did this. But the bridge camp for the actual content, there was no specific syllabus. And as we'll see later, it was more about what helped, we think, is that it was more about helping the students adapt to university level work in a low stakes environment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be also awarded an NSF STEP grant in 2012, and that permitted an expanded um, bridge camp. We increased both the number of students and extended it to chemistry. Our earlier analysis showed that those are the two main sort of problem courses or stumbling block courses for students further progress in their STEM degree. Their, their progress in their first semester math course and or their progress in their first semester chemistry course. Typically uh, uh, students have to do uh, an introductory chemistry course, at least one or two, for all um, uh, STEM majors, pretty much except I think computer science. So we also found this chemistry is a, a difficult course for STEM majors. So we had increased the number of subjects from math and chemistry, and we expanded the total number of students. In 2013, there were about 45 students. We also included uh, in, in 2013, well, we had them earlier, but in a different sort of uh, avenue, we included students who had uh, the possibility scholarship, and we also included students from the business school. The possibility scholarship is uh, a very nice scholarship that Oswego provides, which provides a completely debt-free education to uh, financially disadvantaged but academically bright STEM students. And it's really a signature scholarship uh, at Simi Oswego. It, it, by debt-free, it really means that the students leave with a STEM degree and zero dollars of debt. <coughs> Can I have the next slide, please? So in 2013, there were about 45 students in the two group. Uh, overall, 45 students overall. Was in the morning, students had math, and in the afternoon, students had chemistry. Within chemistry and math, students were split into two groups, with one uh, group in say, math doing uh, calculus pre-calc and another group doing pre-calc algebra. And likewise, in chemistry, we had more we split the students up into two groups: more advanced students and less experienced students. We had we have a, a quite a significant undergraduate summer research program on campus and some of those STEM undergraduate summer research stu students served as tutors and PA mentors for the Bridge Camp in 2013. In 2011 and 2012 we had 14 students each year so this was a really a big jump up to uh, 45 students. <coughs> uh, as I said we had algebra, pre-calc, calc, calc an intro slash advanced chemistry. Um, the set, there was STEM students, students from our STEM scholarship, students from the STEM scholarship, students from Possibility Scholarship, and students from the Business School. The STEM students were selected according to the grant parameters, which were the following. Amongst all the admitted STEM students, their FAFSA EFC score had to be less than 1,000, so showing financial disadvantage and they had to have you know, sufficient academic merit as measured by SAT and high school GPA and by our admissions office. The STEP students who were selected in 2013 were selected at random 
from the admitted STEM students. And the whole logistics and everything for all this was, was really organized by, by the step director. Uh, and she has, she's done a fantastic job in this. Can you have the next slide, please? <clears throat> okay, so the real thing that I wanted to <coughs> chat to you about was the bridge camp assessment. Uh, there are two aspects to it. There's a qualitative and a quantitative uh, part to it. The qualitative aspect is basically interviews with the students in the pre, post type scenario and then perhaps six months later. And we're still following up with a bunch of the students now for the 2013 cohort. We had good data in, in this qualitative sense from the 2012 cohort. In 2011, we were still really finding our feet and uh, finding out about things. It, on the quantitative side, uh, our students take a math placement exam before they start uh, their fall semester, which determines which math course the students will uh, will take go into, whether it's pre-calc, calc, or calc two, or something like that. And so we ask the students to do that before the bridge camp, and then we ask the students to do that again after the bridge camp. And then, really, the 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 main thing is the first semester GPA and then the first year GPA. And when we look at our results from 2011, 2012, and we've done a bit of the analysis from 2013, there's no really statistically significant difference in the first year GPA between a math camp cohort and the non-math camp STEM cohort. That's for 2011 and 2012. So the so you look at the first year GPA of those students who did the, the math camp and those STEM students on all the STEM students who didn't do the math camp. Uh, and there's no really statistically significant difference in the first year GPA. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, but we tried to look at this in a yeah, slightly different way. From our historical records from the Institutional Research Office, for the entire set of STEM freshmen, we can find that what's the probability that a student gets an A, B, or C, which we call the probability of success, and what's the probability that a student gets a D or E, which is the prob probability of lack of success as yet. We have n little n students in the bridge camp. There's a total of a capital N STEM freshmen, and out of the sample of n little n students who come to the bridge camp, we observe, let's say, x failures. Then from the binomial theorem, the probability of getting x failures is that expression there, which I'm sure, sure many of you uh, will know. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, please? And so we use the campus data for 2011, and we find p is 0.371 and q is 0.629. In 2011, we had 18 students who did the bridge camp. There were 14 from the STEM scholarship and four from the business school. And out of that, we had only one failure. So those students did a mixture of courses. Some of them did their first semester math course. Some of them could have, could have been doing pre-calc. Some of them could have been doing calc. Some of them could have even been doing algebra. So the probability of getting only one failure out of 18 students using the 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 P and the Q that we have from campus data is about 0.3%, which is you know, highly significant. In 2012, we had 14 students that participated in the bridge camp, and there were no failures. Uh, so that's you know, very, very significant. Uh, so in 2013, it's a much more complicated situation because we've got math and chemistry and possibly some interaction between the two. We haven't still done this analysis as yet, the indications are, early indications, although you know, I, I wouldn't want you to hold me to this, is that for chemistry it's been very, very successful, and math it's been uh, quite successful too. I, I have a feeling that both will be significant, but I, you know, I, in terms of the model that we've developed, uh, but I, I can't be sure of, about that. Of course, there are some differences in 2013. There's a much larger group of students. We had some differences in the math faculty who, who taught the bridge camp from 2013 as compared to 2012 and 2011. Could we have the next slide, please? 
So the big question to ask is, is our sample, the sample of students who took the bridge camp, is that uh, biased in any way? And that's the sort of thing I want to address now. The NSF STEM, so we had a number of groups of students. We had students funded by the NSF STEM grant. We had students funded by the STEP grant. We had students funded by the Possibility Scholarship. And we had students funded from the Business School. So for the STEM cohort, the selection criteria is that the FAFSA EFC score is less than 1,000. And then given that, we select on the basis of their SAT score. That's amongst all students who are admitted to the college. So this satisfies the academic merit and financial need that was speci specified in the STEM grant. So you know, there's some literature to show clearly that uh, socioeconomic status impacts significantly in college success. And I maybe perhaps I, I think it's reasonable to assume that a FAFSA EFC score of less than a thousand is correlated with socioeconomic status. But so this cut would actually bias the sample, if you like, quotes the other way. And there's various other uh, the references I've given there point to that positive correlation between socioeconomic status and retention to graduation. There's other work that argues that high achieving low income students, which are exactly the sort of sample from the STEM group, are also less likely to graduate from college than their higher income counterparts. All right, next slide, slide please. So let's do the second poll. And the question is, does incoming SAT have a bearing on first year GPA? Okay, it's about 85% have voted, so we can go ahead and close the poll. And it, it should show me the, the poll results. So um, the largest percentage of people said that yes, it does have a bearing on FYGPA. I'll just tell you, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just tell you what I believe, what, what is the situation at SUNY as we go. Because we have a narrow, narrower range of SATs at our, our sort of co cohort, at, at Tony as we go, there is not a correlation between incoming SAT and uh, first year GPA. I think what you, I think if you need to, there is in general a correlation, but for that you need to 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 sample a wide variety of colleges from Harvard to uh, to to four-year arts college, liberal arts colleges, to community colleges, to uh, other Ivy League institutions. If you have that wide range of institutions with a wide range of incoming SAT, then I think there is a small correlation between incoming SAT and first-year GPA. But I can show you a, a graph uh, subsequently at Oswego, which will show you that here at Oswego, we do not have a, a a, co a very strong correlation between incoming SAT and the first year GPA. Okay, can I see the? Okay, so the next slide, please. So we actually wanted to do something more rigorous than this to really uh, hone in on that whether our sample was biased or not, and. Um, so I used this procedure, which was pointed out to me by a number of colleagues by Heckman. Uh, uh, so, uh, very well-known economist he published this in 1976. He actually got the. Oh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? 
Okay. So Heckman's 1976 bias correction procedure, he actually got the Nobel Prize for this and a series of other papers he wrote in the late 70s. So if you have two sort of linear models like this with y1 is your main model, it's related to some independent uh, variables contained in this variable x with some errors u1, that's your main model, but the point about x is you only observe it if your other variable y2 is uh, above a certain cutoff. So you have two variables, if you like, y1, which is a thing that you're really interested in, but there's another variable y2 which controls whether y1 is observed or not. So both you model as, uh, as some linear, uh, as dependent on some linear factors, so x contains the factors that control, that are dependent, that y1 is dependent on, and z is a vector of regressors that control the actual selection procedure, that what, that's what you base your, whether you observe y1 or not. Uh, u1 and u2, the assumptions that this makes are that the errors are normally distributed and independent of each other and so on. And so the y1 is, only, is a primary model and it's only observed if y2 is greater than zero. And this is what we can use to model our bridge count assessment because we only, particularly for the STEM guys, because we only observe those STEM people in the bridge camp if their SAT is above a certain level, because that's the academic cutoff. As I said, the other selection procedure, which was the um, uh, FAFSA EFC, should bias the sample the other way. So I wasn't too concerned with that, but that could easily be included in, in this analysis uh, at a later, later time. <clears throat> we have the next sample, please. So, oh, go back to the previous slide, sorry. Okay, and if the Heckman work in 1976 showed that there's, essentially what you're looking at is this, term, this is a complicated expression, but there's that term R, which is really the correlation between the, your selection variables and your main variable in Y1. The variables that you have in Y2, which determine your selection, and the variables that you have in Y1, which is your main model. And in our case, that's really SAT, and, and the, the Y1 is your first year GPA, let's, let's say, and so you're really looking for the correlation between incoming SAT and first year GPA, and could we have the, the next slide, please? And this is a, a plot on the x-axis, we have incoming SAT, on the y-axis we have first year GPA, this is for all admitted STEM freshmen in 2011, I believe. Uh, I'm very sure that if we did it for later years, it would still pretty, be pretty much the same thing. The, a straight line through, a linear regression through those produces a slope which is very, very close to 0 0.001, so the, the incoming SAT is not really a strong predictor of the first year GPA. Uh, and so if we go back to, so if you go back a slide again, please, Tanya, sorry about that. You can see that because of that, the correlation, that R term is going to be pretty low, so that the bias term, the second term, which comes after the R and the S, is going to be very close to zero. So we, it, my feeling is <laughs> that that STEM sample selection procedure does not really bias the sample. Of course, the step selection procedure is completely random, so there's no such effects at all in that. Okay, can we have the next line? Okay, so that was, that's our sort of qual quantitative assessment uh, strategy. Um, uh, this year, as I said, this year it'll be a bit more complicated because we have uh, math and chemistry, so there's a number of issues. For example, do we look at, do we define success as students who do well in both their first semester math and chemistry courses? We can split the thing up between math and chemistry or consider it as a joint thing. So all of those things are possible and we're still sort of, you know, deciding on that. From the qualitative side of it, on the ba basis of all the interviews and so on that Eric Olson has done, we've had overwhelmingly positive comments this really was an effective bridge into college for students. 
It builds a lot of confidence into students that they can indeed handle college level work in a low stakes environment. So the bridge camp, of course, nothing counts for their degree. So it's a low stakes thing, but yet they're doing degree level work. They get a develop a set of peers, peer friends and so on before college really starts. And you can see some pictures of the sort of typical activities uh, that the students uh, are doing this. We also organize some social events uh, at weekends, uh, particularly for in tw uh, 2013, this last summer. Can you have the, the next slide, please? OK, so let me have the third and final poll. How can quantitative statistical methods be used to rigorously assess pedagogical in initiatives? Okay, so what, eighty-eight percent have voted. So or ninety can we go back? Thank you. So the results are a lot of people not sure, but I'm really happy to see that a lot of people said using multiple regression methods. Uh, so could we please go back to the presentation? So um, of course the perfect way to do this the perfect way to do this is to use randomized designs, but you know, in many cases, it's not always possible to do that, or maybe even ethical to do that. It's very hard to sort of say you, to deny a student some pedagogical initiative, uh, and you know, in some cases, for example, in the case of the STEM grant, we have certain things that we have to stick to because that's what the grant is specified, so we cannot change that. However, I, you know, and of course, not, this is not new. I'm not saying anything new. This, there's a lot of uh, uh, literature to, which uses regression. It's just my experience, and I, again, I could be wrong in the NSF world, in, in the proposals and so on in the reports, that it's not so common. So one of the things I would be very interested in trying is you know, just a simple regression like this as a the first year GPA is somehow related to all the sort of possible factors that you can think of. Incoming SAT, whether the students took part in tutoring, how many hours they were tutored, what's their financial aid status, whether they do, did a, or did not do a math placement exam at SUNY Oswego, for example. Students do a math placement exam before they start their semester, which will determine which math course uh, students go into, whether it's pre-calc, calc, or whatever their de demographic details, their major, whether they're in a living learning community, you know, and categorical data like yes or no could also be included in this fr framework through logis logistic or probate regressions. Uh, my feeling, and, I, and again, I'm somewhat of a newcomer to this, I could be wrong, is that it's not as prevalent in the STEP community as I've seen in other literature in the educational field. And you know, if for example, incoming SAT is not really a good predictor, then that coefficient B that you see on the slide will be small. Uh, if tutoring is important, if students who go to a lot of tutoring do really well and it really affects their first year GPA, you should see that coming through in that coefficient D. And there's lots of you know, for example, F tests and stepwise regression, which can help to show whether the addition of an extra variable you know, adds significant, reduce significantly reduces the error sum of squares. So all of these things are, are you know very very important things to try. Uh, again, I'm not saying that this is the only way. Uh, things like ANOVA and all of this really are other examples of regression. And of course, it has to be hand in hand with the uh, qualitative methods. Um, but this is certainly one as one way to look at more quantitative uh, means to assess pedagogical 
initiatives, particularly with regard to STEM retention. Okay, I think I finished. Is that I got, oh? Let me just talk a bit about the qualitative ass assessment. That uh, in a somewhat more detailed thing, most students over 2012 and 2013. In 2011, we didn't have such good data. Do regard it as a very positive experience. They regarded, reacted positively to the academic intervention. It helped them feel confident. They developed good study habits, which they maintained when the semester really started. As I said before, it prepared them to do college-level work in a low-stakes environment. They developed a social cohort, and that actually lasted, built lasting friendships. There was a peer support structure outside the camp. The camp, the bridge, the bridge camp, helped to initiate this, and you can see that. Uh, peer support structure, you know, persisting, and uh, you know, it has a persistence of about a year, year and a half. 2013 was a much larger group, where 45 students as opposed to 18 or 14. So you know, the peer bonds that formed were less strong, as in the previous two years. And but it is the case that these peer bonds do provide some social pressure to persist in their STEM discipline. The academic content of the camp provides academic help for persistence. It does certainly help students to stay afloat in the first seven or eight weeks of their first fall semester. Students felt the institution cared about them. They felt they had significant initial local knowledge, which really set them apart from other freshmen who didn't experience a bridge camp. And as a result, they felt they had a leg up over you know, other freshmen. I think that's the slide. Oh, <laughs> all right. We still have to analyze results for summer 2013. Uh, we're also considering, you know, more robust measures of the group GPA, such as medians and looking at the median absolute deviation to look at the variance of, on the median uh, to look for statistical significance and so on uh, in subsequent analyses. Okay, I think that's really my talk. I finished rather well below before the time that was allotted to me. I thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. I noticed there were no questions during my talk. Hello, Hi. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, you can um, yeah. ask questions by typing them into the um the questions box, and I also see there's a hand raised, so I'm going to find out who's raised their hand. Um, I think Carla or Zulema had a question. Is that right? I um I was trying to um, lower all of the hands raised, but I couldn't get them all down. So if you're try to Put your hand down, look and see if you have your hand up, and put it down if you don't have a question, and then I will um, open up your mic. I will try to. Anyways, um, okay, great. We have lots of hands raised, so I'm going to um, unmute Zulema first, all right? So let's see if that works. Nope. It didn't seem to work, so we'll try the next person. Uh, sound up, and then sorry about that. Just I'm actually losing. Can you hear me? Or yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I uh, I'm sort of uh, uh, at the SUNY Cobalt School. I'm starting some uh, STEM initiatives here. I have been at Columbia University, and before that, I was at the University of Rochester. So one of the questions that I have is, uh, I just recently wrote a grant, um, but I'm thinking of a sort of cap that helps not only the students that you're coming to say SUNY Las Vegas, uh, but rather the neighborhood around Cobalt School uh, in general. So your bridge camp, was it, uh, so the students who attended these camps basically came to uh, SUNY Las Vegas, or how did it work? Yeah. The, the, the students who, who uh, came to the bridge camp were all SUNY Oswego admit, admitted STEM freshmen. I see. Okay. So they were coming to SUNY Oswego. So as I said, that's part of the reason why it, was, it has been successful, because this is where they were coming. 
and so they came here before the majority of the freshmen. They got to know the place. They got to make some friends. They got to make a. They get to make a start on university level work without it really affecting their degree. And that, so that that I think is actually a crucial factor. So, and if it was the case, for example, if we had a SUNY wide bridge camp where we had students from many different SUNYs who had all been who were all admitted SUNY freshmen. It would still help, I believe, in, in many respects. But you know, one of the important things was that they had they made their the, a peer group which stayed the, here with them in yeah. the first semester and beyond that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to mute you and then open uh, the mic for um, Ordell. All right. Hi. 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 Hello? Ardell, can you, uh, sounds like we have a little echo. I'm going to mute you, and if you'd like to, um, go ahead and type your question in. <laughs> Sometimes we have issues with echoing, and that's why we unmute you one at a time. Um, so, Ardell, if you don't mind typing in your question so we can make sure to answer it. Um, and I'm going to unmute Maureen. Hey, Maureen. Did you have a question? Hey, Maureen, we've unmuted you if you have a question. Okay. I'll mute her again and go to Margaret. All right, Margaret? Nope. She, did you have a question, Margaret? No. Okay. Sorry about that. You had your hand up, so I thought you did. And Erica. Maybe people still have their hands up from when from the beginning of the session. Okay. Did you have a question, Erica? Sounds like not. Okay, we do have a lot of questions being typed in, so we'll go to those next. And finally, there's one hand up from Carla. Carla, did you have a question? Okay, so we just have people's hands up that is left over. So we'll go to the questions that have been typed in. So the first one, I? I'll go ahead and um, post these so people can see. The first question um, is... Uh, okay, so should I speak the answer? Or should, should I speak, speak the answer, Tony? Yeah, please speak the answer. Okay, so Stanley asks about the binomial distribution. He, he's not a mathematician. So the binomial distribution is really, uh, if you have two choices, we have two outcomes to an experiment, and you do the experiment a number of times, the binomial distribution tells you how that experiment may go over a large number of trials. So in this particular case, we have an experiment. It sounds a bit callous to say that, but I hope you understand the sentiment with which I'm saying it. Uh, the students can either do well or poorly in their, in their math exam. By well, I mean A, B, or C. By poorly, I mean they get a D or E. And from historical records, not from this year, but previous years, we can find out in, amongst the general population of STEM freshmen what the probability of success, that is getting an A, B, or C in their first semester math course is, as opposed to the probability of failure, which is just going to be 1 minus that. And from 2011, we find that to be, a, I think it was the probability of success is 0.37, probability of failure is 0.6 something, I've forgotten that. So when you have a... 18 students in the math camp, the question you are, and, you, and say one student out of those 18 students gets a failure, the question to ask is what's the probability out of the, any 18 students that are drawn from your general population of STEM freshmen of getting one failure? So that's the sort of question the, pro, the uh, binomial distribution can answer. And one of the other ways where this analysis also is helpful is that it splits up it, A, B, and C it doesn't take the average, which is partly why when you take the average of the GPA of the math camp cohort as opposed to the non-math camp cohort, there's no statistical difference because of outliers and so on. Does that answer your question, Stanley? 
I hope that answers you can, your You question. can put another question in to say if you, if that, if you have a follow-up. Okay. So, can the assessment questions be shared? You, do you mean but the qualitative assessments? I can certainly ask Eric Olson about the qualitative assessment and ask those to be shared on Step Central. Is that what um, Zulema was asking about? I, okay. Okay. So, um, that's what she said. Yes, Su that's what she's asking. Susan, Susan was also asking about sharing the, uh, oops, to receive a copy. Susan was also asking about um, receiving a copy of the question used for the qualitative as assessment and the math placement exam. So the math placement exam, at least for the last two years, was this AccuPlacer exam, which is a sort of commercial product, which our administration uh, buys. Um, uh, I can certainly inquire about that uh, and and let Tanya know, and she can post, say, last year's AccuPlacer exams and so on on the Step Central website. But if you type in AccuPlacer in Google, you should be able to get to that. But I'll certainly work on that and get that to Tanya. <coughs> okay. Okay. Zulema has another question. When the students took the math placement post tests at the end of the bridge, did they test into a higher level math for the fall semester? So that's an interesting question. In 2011 and 2012, their scores on the math placement generally went up. I can say that. And the, the problem which Karen can talk to about is that the math placement, that is, that is the, the course that the students are placed into, is not compulsory. So a student can insist, even though their AccuPlacer score puts them in a particular math course, can insist on being in a higher level course. And so that's also affected the results. So we're really currently, you know, discussing how best to deal with that. Uh, so they generally did improve their math placement tests. The, the post math placement tests were generally better than their pre-math camp placement tests. But whether that translated into them going into a higher level course is not quite clear right now. Okay. I think we had one well, more from Tar Tarnisha. Okay. Yeah, I can certainly, we're recording these and I can certainly, Tanya has these slides and she can certainly post them on Step Central. Right? <laughs> um, yes, definitely. They will be posted. And there was a question. Did you already answer where the students in the program offered university credit for the courses they took? Okay. No, I haven't. That's the good. students who took the bridge camp were not offered university credit. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I think it worked, because it's a low-staked environment. It was not the student, It was clear that this was not part of their degree. And we tried to make it very clear that this was something that was going to help them with their degree to prepare for the, quotes, onslaught that was to come in the fourth semester. Uh, the, did the, stu the question was, did you interact with the students all day or were they assigned times like any regular courses? So it's sort of evolving. In the first year we did this, the math uh, co courses were in the morning. But it was really you know, very, very relaxed. It was com that we were all entirely up to the math instructors and the math professors who gave that. You know, they, could, they got to know the students very well. There was no set syllabus. Sometimes they, as I know the math professor, sometimes they'd go out in the summer and do yoga outside <laughs> and come back in. Uh, so it was a very relaxed sort of setting. Uh, it was not very assigned that we're going to do X, Y, and Z this year, now, and then tomorrow we're going to do this, 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 and there's going to be a quiz on Friday. I don't believe those things occurred. So that's, again, part of the strength, I think, of the bridge camp things. Uh, OK. I think that was all the questions. Um, oh, there's, OK. Maybe? Yes. OK, Zulema. I can certainly share the assessment questions. OK, thank you. I'll Google it. Oh, we have some more questions coming in. OK. Can we see a sample itinerary for the program? OK, I can certainly post something. Uh, 
with the help of Karen Valentino, and I'll give it to Tanya, and then she can post that on Step Central. As regards, so that will be like, you know, the, it was roughly that we had math in the morning and chemistry in the afternoon, and in the evening uh, we had um, so the, the senior undergraduates helping them with their, with their homeworks and things like that. That's in 2013. In the first two years, we had math in the morning and STEM sort of talks in the afternoon. Uh, but we will certainly can post a sample itinerary uh, for you. Definitely. And then from STEM. Oh. Can you ask if they took, if they looked at actual retention in STEM, that GPA could come from non-STEM retention courses? Okay. Uh, Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, our initial data that, that was a basis of the STEM and the STEP grant did clearly show that of those students who, who transferred out of STEM at the end of the first year, uh, or who failed out of STEM, let's say, there was no uh, statistical difference in their incoming SAT. So it did not seem like it was math, quotes, preparation that was the issue for those students who, who transferred out of STEM. The GPA, no, the, the binomial analysis that I talked about was entirely there. Uh, the binomial analysis that I talked about is entirely related to their math courses the, and the end of first semester math courses. The plot that I showed you, the first year GPA showing a very little correlation between that and incoming SAT, that's their first year GPA in anything. So for some students it could be that they did a lot of their courses from their major and other students because of their thing they, they did a more gen ed courses. But generally speaking, the students in their first semester would do courses like maybe they do introductory chemistry and their, their first semester math course. And then the second semester, they'd be doing the follow-up courses on that. So I, I can't specifically answer Stanley's question, but I think it, it, they did come from their STEM major. We are definitely going to follow students over time from now on, from 2011. We're definitely doing that. Uh, for the 2011 and 2012 cohorts, we have very good results. The, STEM, the retention in STEM is over 90%. I can say that. Not, even the 2011 cohort haven't actually graduated as yet, but mm -hmm. they're still in STEM. Uh, and um, Pamela was asks, was there any online okay. component to the math work? Okay. Instead. So in in one of, in 2010 and 2011 and 2012, there was a web assigned component. In 2013, there was an Alex component for both chemistry and math. And we're really actively investigating Alex in both chemistry and math, probably more so in math, to further help our retention initiatives. And then Pamela also asks, do you have or are you considering any similar program for students who cannot come to the campus for three weeks? Uh, so, that's a, so that's a very interesting question. Yeah, that's where the Alex things come in and we're sort of, that's under discussion. Can we, for example, have students say that they need to achieve a certain level of proficiency in Alex by the time they come to the, to the uh, fall semester. Uh, is, can we do that? Uh, is that a possibility? That's one of the things that we, we were considering. Uh, and so we are considering all those options that Pamela talks about. And um, one final question. May I also request some of the qualitative assessment questions used in the Bridge Camp? <laughs> sure. That's that's what I took to mean. That's the work that Eric Olson did, and I will definitely uh, get that to Tanya so she can post that on the Step Central website. Okay. Um, another question from Tarnisha. How long were they actually on campus? Was it a hybrid course, or were Maybe three weeks. We're oh, three weeks. Okay. I'll push three that. weeks. Three weeks. Okay. Great. Wonderful to have so many questions. Thanks, everyone. And uh, many people have asked about 
um, being able to see some of the assessment questions and the slides, and we will be posting those okay. on um, Web Central. So why don't I go ahead, um, as a way to wrap up, uh, show you where you can find those. So I'm going to open up um, SEP Central here. So we have the SEP Central website. Um, this is the home page, and what you want to do to find resources related to this webinar are to go to News and Events um, under Webinars. Click on Webinars, and um, you will see actually the first webinar listed is um, um, Shashi Kanber's webinar, um, and when you go, it'll probably be under the recent tab because it'll switch to be a recent webinar next week. And so, but you can go ahead and view details. And inside this uh, resource, there is an area here below where we will post the PowerPoint. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar and the assessment questions and the other resources that you guys have been requesting. Um, through this webinar, so please make sure you check that out. Um, um, I also encourage you to, um, when you're in Step Central, to go to the Bridge Programs Working Group. This is where this webinar is, is located. It's actually within the Bridge Programs Working Group. So you can get there by going to Working Groups. Um, and it's actually the first one. <laughs> so you can click on it. And I highly encourage you to subscribe to that working group if this is something that you're interested in learning more about or you're starting a working starting a bridge program. Um, we have an active facilitator who is looking to um, coordinate with other leaders in the STEP community and STEM community to produce resources that help people out with working groups. So I encourage you to subscribe and um, get involved in that. And also right here you can see that this webinar is listed in part of the working group resources down below. So that's another way to find that. Um, and we did get another question in. Um, oh, okay. That's true. Sure. From um, from Tarnisha, do do they do online and on campus simultaneously? Uh, no, no. Yeah, they did online some while they were on campus. Yes. So it was not a hybrid. In, in that sense, they, they were on campus for three weeks. They did stuff in the classroom. They did stuff online and while they were on campus. Uh, but we're definitely looking into the idea of using things like Alex, you know, to expand the program, uh, even if the students don't come to campus. Okay. Any more questions? <clears throat> Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Canber, for taking the time and your expertise with the STEP community today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and hope you can come back again someday to share more when you maybe have finished your assessment of 2013. And all of you who joined us today, thank you guys as well, and I hope that you join us for future webinars. And um, with that, I'll stop the recording and um, stop the webinar. So uh, I think that's it. Let's see if I can find the appropriate place to do that. Here we go. All right. I'm not finding my recording thing. There it is. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs> thank Bye. you.